Welcome to Insiders, live from Surf Park Summit in La Jolla, California. I have with me today in person, Damon Tudor, who I feel strangely connected to because we've spent hours talking over Zoom, uh, but never met in person. And as advertised, he's extremely tall. Uh, but uh, welcome, welcome to Surf Park Summit. Damo, how are you feeling? Great, Jess. What can I say? I mean, it's it's a little bit surreal being here in person. Um, you know, you guys and the teams and other surf park people around the world, I've actually known for years, but it's always been over that bloody square screen we hide behind. Um, so to be here, I was telling the guys earlier, it was kind of like being at my wedding 20 years ago, uh, where you're running around meeting a bunch of people, don't know which way to turn, but it's kind of exciting but terrifying at the same time. So look, all that, just stoked to be here. It's great. Yeah. Awesome. I've, I've heard that from a couple of people. It's weird because you know all the faces and you've talked to these people for so long and uh, COVID's kind of kept us all apart for a little while. So I'm really stoked that you're here. What are your first impressions so far? You were at the VIP event last night with Sean Thompson. We had some uh, great music and food and drinks and good times. What were your first impressions? Yeah, re really good vibe in the room. We're right at the, the beginning of an industry. It's a pretty crazy sort of experience at the moment being you know, at the forefront of us, I think, as a lot of us are. There's a lot of excitement. Um, I think there's a, a real appreciation of, you know, even from, from core surface from way back, that this is something that's real and it's emerging, you know. So I could really sense that in the room. Um, you know, having it at the, at the surf shed was just unbelievable. The array of boards and the, the, the quality of the stuff there and hearing Sean speak, it's just fantastic. And, and here we are down in San Diego on the weather's cracking. Not much swell, unfortunately, but, you know, it's just a great vibe. So I, I think just seeing everyone together and having chats and, you know, seeing as the two days unfold so far, my impressions have been just really enjoying it, you know. So well done to you guys. La Jolla does a lot of the work for us. And uh, as you said, the weather is pretty dang beautiful today. What's the most important thing for you and your team for coming over? What do you guys hope to, to get out of Summit? Look, it's definitely the networking aspect. We want to meet people. All these people we've gotten to know and have asked us for opinions or views on things and all that sort of stuff. It's really important that we can portray that, you know, certainly what you're seeing from someone behind a screen, when you're in person, you're reading body language, you're having conversation, you're sharing a lot more stories. You know, it's just human nature, right? But I think for us, um, meeting the other operators, meeting new developers, meeting new tech, all of these things are super important um, at the end of the day, certainly from, from my perspective, and that's what we're looking for too. But also to um, hopefully provide some insights as far as we can around, hey, look, here's what we've learned. Maybe we can share a bit of that, get people prepped because, you know, it can be quite a challenge doing what we do in any type of new and emerging industry with a high degree of engineering and risk. But at the same time, also pointing out that the, the reward and the output is just phenomenal. You know, and that's something I still enjoy to this day when I rock up to the Melbourne Park and I look through the gates and just see people getting out of the water with a smile on the face. That's it. It's that simple, right? That's what we're all hoping for. Very cool. Now, speaking about the Melbourne Park and smiles on faces, um, on the drive here this morning, I was listening to the Lipped podcast you might be familiar with from Australia, and they were talking about Winter Jam. In very glowing terms, I saw some imagery that looked amazing. Could you tell us a little bit about, about that? Because to me, it seemed like really innovative programming to bring people to the park in the middle of winter. Jimmy from Lyft is actually James Miles, who's here with us on the conference. He's a good guy, works, works for us. He's the, our head of sales and partnerships. And look, he and our head of marketing, marketing Haley, uh, and the rest of the team, Angus and events, um, they've been doing a great job with these events. And, and I think during COVID, you know, everyone's pretty well aware of urban surf being closed six times and all this sort of madness that we endured for a couple of years events program and hospitality just got so incredibly disrupted um, during that time. We had some planned programs over a long term to be able to take advantage of events at the park and the unique nature of the asset. These types of events coming back to Winter Jam, us trying to just get back on the map in the post-COVID world, even though it's still there, but you know, I guess we call it post-COVID from an Australian perspective because you know, there's no lockdowns, it hasn't been since last October, so this is real now. And Winter Jam was one way for us to kind of celebrate, A, look, it gets pretty chilly in Melbourne. You know, the water temperature when I surfed there in July was eight degrees. It's, it's pretty fresh, <laughs> you know, but at the same time, connecting awesome, awesome action sports like snowboarding or skiing or whatever it might be with surfing. You know, there's a natural fit there. Most of us, I think, who surf, we snowboard as well. I do. Um, you know, and trying to bring that together 
in our quieter time, which is typically winter, was just something we wanted to achieve. And I think, you know, there was a nice blend there of those types of activities. And it was a lot of fun too. There was just a great vibe. You know, you find with these things when you're combining those events, it's just when you combine the sports, it's so relaxed, chilled out, people are having a great time. And, you know, some of these snowboarders, the stuff they're doing, you know, it terrifies me. I reckon I'd break a few arms even trying half that stuff, you know. So, but yeah, really, really exciting. The team did a great job. And that was a really important thing for us in, in winter, especially. And you'd actually set up a slope of some kind with some features on there for the snowboarders, is that right? We did, yeah. So, wheeled in the snow, basically. It's kind of comparable to, you know, I spent 10 years living in Dubai and you had Ski Dubai over there in yeah. Mall of the Emirates, which is a big artificial freezer with um, man-made snow, so to speak. Similar sort of thing. We literally shipped it down on the back of uh, tip trucks and, and created the slope and carved it out, put in the rails and saw some pretty, pretty cool tricks, you know. So, that, it was a lot of fun. I've got to ask you about the less fun stuff. And I understand that the Sydney project is running into um, you know, some issues beyond your control. The weather's been weird all over the world. Can you tell us a little bit about where you're at and what kind of um, headwinds you've been facing there? We dealt with the COVID situation for a couple of years. And when Melbourne opened, we had to make a decision at that point whether we push forward with Sydney or did we try and slow it down. And we took the decision that we're going to keep going. You know, um, There was a whole bunch of things that were attached to that. Um, we did the capital raise pretty much all by, via video calls for the Sydney project, which you know, was just a pretty crazy sort of experience. Some of our investors hadn't even been physically to the Melbourne Park to be able to sell it. And then you have to remember too is that when we kicked that off, we'd had an intermittent trading period in Melbourne too. So when you're you know, talking to investors, we traded for 11 weeks, then we'll close. And we traded for maybe five weeks, then we closed. And we traded. For, so we're selling a story that says, well, there's 11 weeks of trade, five here, eight there, as well as trying to articulate the vision. So a, a pretty tough sort of ask, but we got the cap raise done, which was great. Came out of COVID last October, the construction actually started um, around the same time last year. Um, and then, you know, I don't think what was anticipated was the scale of rain that occurred from January onwards. So they're already high risk projects, right? So basically as soon as the, the ground got opened up and it's actually a reclaimed site, so it's contaminated. So it's, it's a good news story in terms of the use of the, the site. Um, so when it gets wet and it rains, you have to treat any water that's on the site before you can remove it, right? So that just adds cost, adds problems, adds time. You know, it's just one of those things with construction. Here's the crazy stat, right? So in Melbourne, we were 12, 12 months late. Uh, we had 364 millimetres of rain around that time. In Sydney, we're probably looking around the same. I think it'll be you know, early 2024 when we open now. But we've had over 2,000 millimetres of rain in the space of January to August. Um, and that's the highest recorded rainfall in 164 years of recorded history in Sydney. I think uh, the surf gods are angry at me for some reason, you know, but it's really difficult. You know, you just want to make these things work and you want to work hard and do a good job. Uh, rain certainly had an impact, but then there's also the factors post-COVID in the construction industry. Every other project I talk to is facing similar challenges around escalation in steel costs, concrete, timber, just building materials. Shipping is a little bit nuts at the moment as well. But that's all contributed at the same time to the challenges we face. So we had to pause, just realign a few things. Um, we've reset the program for that. We're uh, getting some additional funding to complete the project because we know once Sydney opens, it will be epic. You know, So I think there's that inherent belief in the project. It's in a great spot, definitely some challenges to work through. But once you pass construction and you're into operation, life should be really good because we've seen it in Melbourne, right? So you believe in the product. The Homebush shot, I think, is well situated and I, I appreciate the good news story about the contaminated land. I remember when Olympic Park was built, it was the same kind of deal of this is a good spot to put it because the land needed remediation. So uh, 2024 opening, where do you see urban surf having, I don't know, this is probably a tough question because you are in the nuts and bolts of getting this thing off the ground, but let's a little further past that. Where do you think urban surf is likely to be in five years from now? I think it's definitely a short-term focus of let's get the Sydney construction de-risked and sorted and open and trading, right? So we've got the two parks in operation and you know, we we're talking about valuations in the investor session earlier, and you know that's a really important part of that piece. Um, you know, shareholders um, want to see the results, and that's fair enough. For us, um, really, in that five-year period, I think um, having the two parks embedded trading over a full year. We just came came off September in Melbourne, which was the first time we traded in September since we actually launched the business. Would you believe? Thanks wow. to COVID. Yep. Um, getting Sydney trading for you know at least 12 months to bed down the seasonality and how it works, looking at how we deliver enhanced and ancillary revenue streams. And then even, um, you know, we've got our third project, which is kind of in the pipe, that's in due diligence phases, but also going through um, understanding of the cost profile that it looks like as well, because that future project, as we're seeing with other new builds around the world, 
is going to be up by a significant number just based on what we're dealing with. So how do you time that? How do you do that correctly? So, you know, for us, it's really that, that two plus that third in the pipeline, I reckon, in the five-year period. Hopefully, we're a bit further advanced, but we've got to be realistic as well. We want to make sure the core business and what we do and fundamentally is right. You know, and I think that gives confidence not only to our investors and how we work, but to the industry at large as well. Any scoops on the geography of the third location? Oh, I can't go into too much detail on this one, mate, but w well asked. But yeah, <laughs> I have to keep some things a little bit quiet. There's a, Fair enough. There's a hot market out there. <laughs> what do you think about the industry more broadly then in five years? Uh, you know, we have seen a little slowing, but it does appear as though 2023, 20, 2024 is going to be kind of a boom time. What do you think the industry at large will be in five years? I think over the next couple of years, we're going to see some projects slow down, um, just based on what we've just talked about. Having said that, you know, when I look at what we've done in Melbourne, level of participation from broader demographics has been fantastic. And we've definitely tried to create a very inclusive environment for people of all walks of life, gender, wherever you're from, doesn't matter. Um, that's really a core of what we want to be to surfing, right? So. You know, you definitely want your core surfer to really appreciate and love it and enjoy it, so you need the good wave. But you want those people that feel a bit intimidated by being in the ocean or currents or sharks or whatever it might be, other surfers. Um, you want them to come to a place where they feel comfortable, um, they can experience progression, um, they can just get hooked like so many of us do around surfing, right? You know, it's, it's a lifestyle, you know? And uh, I think for me, the reason I talk about that, it's a little bit fluffy, but it is really what is at the essence of what we're all about. Um, so I think, you know, the surf parks that kind of capture that culture, so to speak, and, and develop that and grow it, because, you know, there's countries around the world where surfing isn't as, you know, dominant in terms of the culture as Australia. So I think you have to have those types of solutions. So that's where I think the industry is going to go. I think we will see some growth. I think we're going to see new technologies emerging with different experiences, which I think is positive from a customer perspective. That's what we're all about at the end of the day. I think it's going to be some exciting times to see some of these new um, plays as well, because we run basically a concession model where we're selling tickets to the public, um, but we're going to see real estate developments, all these types of things, you know, aka like the golf course model that's existed, you know. So I think really exciting. I think we'll see a, a pretty significant growth, but I, I reckon just by the nature of any type of new business like this, we'll see some probably see some dropouts. We'll see some that will get through. I think we'll see some consolidation of groups as well, try and find benefits of scale. Uh, I think all these things are really relevant, but um, you know that's, that's pretty far down the track when you think about the next few years. There's a fair bit of work to get through, but that, that's kind of where I see it. But I think at the end of the day, if we're bringing surfing to the broader masses, it's going to change how competitions work. It's going to change how progression works. It's going to change kind of the face of surfing. And I'm a big believer in never losing the roots of what surfing and where it comes from because you know I, I still love surfing the ocean that's my first love and it will always be my first love but there's no doubt that the lagoons and the pools are changing the face of it you know which is really exciting but we can embrace that while still maintaining that core passion we have you know absolutely well thank you very much uh damon i don't want to take up too much of your time i wanted to let you to uh go back inside and and get some more of the scoop from surf park summer but thanks very much for your time today i really appreciate it mate great to catch up in person finally mate and love it thank you All right. cheers damo